Welcome to Eagle Brook Church. I am so glad that you're here. One of the reasons I'm really glad that you're here is this weekend is my birthday. I turned 36 yesterday, and I just can't think of who I would rather spend my birthday weekend than with some of my favorite people doing what I love to do the most in the world, and that's talking about God. I love talking about God, even the people that sometimes don't even believe in God. I'm going, but guess what? I, I think he wants to have a relationship with you. And so I'm so excited to kick off this series called Talking to the Ceiling today. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at what in the world it means to have a conversation with God. Now, let's just say uh, it's your first time in church and you're thinking about having a relationship with God or you're somewhat new to having a relationship with God. Talking to God might be the most intimidating component of it all. Even if you've been a Christian a very long time, I think we all have to admit that when we start talking about talking to God, things can get a little weird, right? Right? I mean, like you've got these people that are like walking in circles and you're like, hey man, what are you doing? And you're like, I'm talking to God. Give me some space. You're like, are you sure? Sometimes it can look like they're talking to the ceiling. I mean, just think about this for a minute. We have God who created the heavens and the earth. And I can't speak for you, but, but anytime I encounter nature, anytime that I'm looking at a, a mountain range, anytime that I'm standing on the shores of a beach and you just look out as far as the eye can see, you just kind of get this moment where you're going, man can't create this stuff. And you just, you kind of sit back and you go, there's nothing about me that is ocean-like. There's nothing about me that is Everest-like level. I think most of us get, okay, there is this God. So then this amazing Big God sends his one and only son because he loved us so much. So he sends his son to die for us. And we just kind of sit back and we go, oh, I, I cannot believe a God would send down his son for you and for me. And, and the reality is, is that you and I could not have a relationship with God on our own. And so we needed help. And so Jesus volunteers his life by laying it down for us. So the main idea of what we do is we go, okay, we're gonna, if someone laid down their life for us, we're gonna follow Jesus. And so then what we do as Christians is we look at the life of Jesus, how he treated people, how he talked to people, how he went out of his way for people, how he showed grace to people, how he prayed for his enemies and tried to tip the scales for the marginalized in his community and looked out for his neighbor. We look at all of that and say, hey, we should live like that. That's what it means to be a Christian. And somewhere in the process of following Jesus, we're supposed to talk to God, which once you start doing it, you can kind of feel like you're talking to the ceiling. It's, it's kind of weird. And in fact, when you, when you look in Scripture, people who heard from God, who had conversations with God, apparently... God talks back, and that can get even weirder because in the Old Testament, God's most infamous conversations were with men through burning bushes and clouds and a donkey. That's weird, okay? Listen, if you told me that you were in your backyard grilling, you say, hey, why don't we light up the bush so we can talk to God? We would say that's stranger things, would we not? <laughs> in fact, when someone tells us God told them something, our eyes get a little bit bigger, don't they? You go, G-O-D told you that? <laughs> like he said, God, God, like our heavenly father told you that? Yeah, God told me she's my wife. Well, did he tell her? That's important, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's amazing some things that people will say G-O-D told them. Now, here, here's what I want you to know. Christian or not, church veteran or not, grew up Lutheran, Catholic, Episcopalian, Methodist, Charismatic, or Baptist, or maybe when you look at the list of religious affiliations, you would check none of the above, Ryan. This is what I want every single person listening or watching this message to know. God wants to talk to you. God wants to talk to you, and I don't know where you are in your faith right now. You may have made a ton of mistakes in your life. You may feel far from God. 
But do you know the point of why we were created? We see it in the beginning of scripture with Adam and Eve. One of the reasons we were created was to walk and talk with God. And, and maybe you've heard this a million times. Or maybe for you it's the first time. But I, I have to tell you, God loves you so much. He wants to talk with you, not just to you, with you. He doesn't want to talk at you. He wants to have a relationship with you. NASA recently posted this, this new image of something that they've captured, which they refer to as the planetary nebula and known informally as the Southern Ring Nebula. Uh, they estimate that this is approximately 2,500 light years away. In case you're not a science person, one light year is about 6 trillion miles. Multiply that by 2,500, and that's the distance between us and that. Our God made that, and the scripture says... By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And what just floors me is the fact that an all-powerful God who uses the breath of his mouth to create galaxies would use his mouth to speak to you and to me. I mean, it should just make us all just pause for a little bit in our week and go, you want to talk to me? The same God that manages creation in the palm of his hand wants to have a relationship, dare I say, a conversation with you and me. And some people wonder why we call it good news. What else would you call that? What else would you call a God that would create all that and send his one and only son for us to have a relationship with him? Yeah, that sounds like good news to me. So, what I want to do at the beginning of this series is unpack the question, man, what does, a, what does a conversation with God sound like? I mean, if we're talking about the almighty God, like, what does that look like? What does it sound like? I know Hollywood has made us to believe that God sounds like Morgan Freeman. I get it, okay? I get it. I get it. I get it. James Earl Jones, you know, coming through the call. Like, I get it. But the truth of the matter for all of us is if we really want to know what God sounds like, we have to listen for his voice in his word. Whenever I'm, I'm talking with someone who's, who's telling me they really want to hear from God and are struggling to hear from him, um, I typically ask them one question. I ask them, hey, how much time have you spent in God's word lately? How much time have you spent in God's word lately? And it's not to guilt them or, or to judge them, but, you know, the average Christian, you know, they kind of do the U version verse of the day, you know, hit God with a drive-by type of deal, you know, like, but they're not spending a whole lot of time in the word of God. And, and we're going to, you're going to hear this a lot in the series, but you can't expect to hear from God with our Bibles closed. Like, if you want to hear from God, you got to know what God sounds like, how he how, how he talks, hearing from God is going to require our time and attention. And here's the deal. I, I know school's getting ready to start. Okay, I know work schedules are crazy. I know the NFL season begins in a couple weeks. I, I know our kids are triathletes now. Okay, they play like seven sports. I get it, all right? Like, we're all busier than we've ever been. But I'm also more amazed than ever by the things we actually make time for. I got friends that'll tell me they don't have time to read their Bible, but they can tell me every single detail about Amber Heard and Johnny Depp. It's amazing to me. I'm like, how do you know all this stuff? They can tell me stuff about their neighbors. Yeah, she does. I'm like, are you just standing at the window all day? You got time to talk to God. I'm telling you, like, it's, I'm just amazed at how much time we have for social media. And here, here's the deal. I just, I just think for us, if we really want to hear from God, I think we're going to have to pause our schedules just a little bit and put ourselves in a prime position to hear from God. Now, when you and I make time to have a conversation with God, here's what I believe happens. In exchange, it's a great 
exchange. It's usually us giving up something and getting something better in return. When I, when I look through the scriptures to see how God talks with men and women, I see three primary exchanges that often happen in those conversations that I believe can happen for us. The first exchange that I believe can happen when talking with God is, number one, we exchange our way for his perspective. Because you and I have a way of doing things, and what we desperately need is a better perspective. Um, in the book of Acts, uh, there was a military man named Cornelius who was a part of the Italian regiment, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. Scripture tells us that one day he hears from God that he needs to send men to bring back a man named Peter who was a part of Jesus' inner circle. Now, the only problem with this invitation is that when Christianity began, there were many Jews who believed that Jesus was exclusive for them and nobody outside their Jewish circle. So if you weren't Jewish, you were labeled Gentile. So this military man, Cornelius, is a Gentile inviting a Jewish follower of Jesus into his home, which in normal circumstances, Peter would say, that's a, that, that, that's a no for me. So scripture tells us that the day after Cornelius heard from God about inviting Peter to his house, Peter also had a vision. It, he could have been uh, sleeping. He was in a, a deep prayer time, and God wanted to reveal something to him. And Acts 10 tells us what he saw in this vision. He says he saw heaven opened, and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me. Sometimes God has to tell me things a few times before I really get it. I'm sometimes in the three times club, for sure. <laughs> so Peter gets this vision, and as soon as it's over, the men that Cornelius sent to, to get him, uh, they arrive, and they say, hey, will, will you come back to, to our boss's place? And Peter accepts the invitation. He heads back with Cornelius' men, and whenever he gets to the house, Acts chapter 10 tells us that this happens. It says, he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. You see, Peter had a particular way of seeing things and not just things people. And what's amazing to me is the transition that hearing from God can take someone on. Did you notice the transition in the verses? You see verse 14, it says, surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And 14 verses later in verse 28, it says, but God has shown me that I should not call any one impure or unclean. Anything became anyone. That's what can happen when we have conversations with God. We begin to see things and people from a different perspective. Here's something I want us all to consider this weekend. What is it that God could be trying to show you? In your life, in your job, in your family, in your school, bless you. <laughs> what could God be trying to show you? Could it be a job you currently tolerate that God wants you to see differently? Now, <laughs> maybe you prayed for that job and now you find yourself frustrated with your answered prayer. God's like, I gave you what you asked for. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe you prayed for patience 
and now you have that boss. It's going to be really hard to get patience unless you're dealing with someone that actually requires it, right? The perspective I got a while ago is that while I can be one of the most impatient people in the world, I'm often the person that others need patience for the most. I mean, it's easy for me to just kind of walk around and go, I wish you all would just get your stuff together. Somebody's doing the same thing with me. And how do you know someone doesn't need patience for you? What I know about me is that I, I have a particular lens, a particular way of seeing things that is often convenient for me. But when I go to God with that, I often get a different perspective. Could it be that God wants you, like Peter, to see someone else different? Maybe it's someone with a different color of skin than you that you've put in a particular category. I mean, we could put each other in all sorts of categories, couldn't we? White, black, rich, poor, and come to conclusions about one another that very well could be false. And I just have to wonder if God wants us to see each other just a little bit different. I wonder if God wants you to see your spouse from his perspective. I wonder if God wants you to see your kids from his perspective. I wonder if God wants you to see your enemies from his perspective. I just, I know a lot of people who have an ax to grind with the church at large and, and people can find themselves in a category of people where they, they've experienced a great deal of church hurt and, and that church hurt is legitimate. Like people did something. I just, I just, if you find yourself in that category, I just have to wonder what it would look like for you to just go to God and get his perspective on all that. Because sometimes our way of dealing with someone is just walking away from them or holding bitterness towards someone that hurt us. And I just, I have to just pause and reflect for a moment and just wonder if that's the best plan for anybody's life. Or anybody's faith, I very much think a certain way based off of my upbringing and experiences. And what's desperately needed for me is consistently needing to take that to God and get his perspective. The second exchange that I believe happens when we talk with God is we exchange our will for his plans. We exchange our will for what we want to do for his his plans. What, what I know to be true about you and me is that we all have a will. Our will is what we want to happen for us. We all have preferred outcomes that go in our favor. We all have preferred career outcomes. We all have preferred living situations. Some of us, our preferred living situations is a preferred square footage, perhaps preferred number of homes in our possession and preferred locations. I mean, we all have preferred love and relationship outcomes. We have preferred education outcomes. Sometimes we even can put some of our preferred outcomes on our children. And we don't all just have what we prefer, but we also have when we prefer it to happen. And I think this is why Jesus taught his disciples to pray this way. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't it easy to, be to become consumed in 2022 with building our name? our little kingdom, and making our will happen. I just find that a large portion of our energy is geared towards making our preferred outcomes and our preferred will happen. But when we talk to God, our name, our little kingdom, and our will just gets a little bit smaller. This is really good news for anyone who's ever woken up believing that they have to make a name for themselves. Oh, I'm going to show you. You actually don't got to do that. 
It's freedom. Like, whoa, just, just imagine this. Just, just imagine what your life would look like if you woke up on a daily basis going, what if I just spent my energy trying to make his name great? All the pressure's off. You don't got to perform. You don't got to prove anything to anybody. You're just like, man, I, I, I'm on the planet to make his name great. I love what Proverbs 16 verse 3 says. It says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Ah, my favorite word in this is whatever, because whatever includes a lot of stuff. It's kind of like everything. Okay, like whatever you do. So what are you going to do this week? What are your plans? You get ready for school. What are you going out to eat? You're going to the gym. What are you going to, going to your job? You're going to the office. What are you going on a date? Here's the deal. If you want to have a conversation with God, hey, whatever you do, commit that to the Lord. A conversation with God sounds like Hey, God, here, here's, here's what I'm going to do <laughs> this week. Here, here's kind of what's on my schedule. Here's kind of what I got going on this week. And before I do that, I just want to commit all of that to you. Look, here, here's, what's, here's what's going on in my life. I just want to commit all of that to you. Here, here's what I want you to know, whether you're a Christian or not. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, just giving you some common denominators. People who do that consistently minimize the number of dumb decisions they make in their life. People who do that consistently, people that on a daily, weekly, monthly basis are just going, God, here's, here's all my stuff. I just, I, just, I just committed to you. Those people have the fewest regrets because they've just said, hey, Lord, before I, before I go on this date, before I accept this job, before I even apply for this job, before I send my kids to this school, before, before I make all these decisions, God, I just want to commit this to you. Those people have the fewest regrets of anybody I know in my life. At some point, you and I have to pause and consider this question. And maybe, maybe it's a dinner conversation for you this week. Maybe, maybe in a small group, you, you guys discuss this question. Um, what area of our life do we have the hardest time committing to God? Because for some, it's an addiction. For some, it's a sport. Playing one, watching one. For some, it's money. For another, it's a romantic relationships, sometimes we can have this thing with God where we're okay with him being in charge with parts of our life, but not all of our life. For some, it's I surrender all. For others, it's I surrender some, and I'm going to hold on to something else. And here's, I'm not going to tell you what to do in all of those areas in your life today, but I would ask you to consider what it would look like for you to talk with God about those things, perhaps he might have a different plan than what you and I have. The third exchange I believe happens when we talk with God is we exchange our worries for his peace. We exchange our worries for his peace. Man, I just, I just wonder how many people are here today that could just use a little bit of peace. I can't tell you how many people I talk to they just have so much trouble sleeping because they go to bed with the weight of the world on their shoulders. The weight of their little kingdom. And, it just, and I think that's why we desperately need to talk to God. So I think we desperately need to have a conversation with God. I just, I love what, what Jesus has to say about this. This is, what, this is what he says in Matthew chapter six. He says, therefore I tell you, do not, Worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Here's the, I think we all have a worry list, right? It's pretty long. Our jobs, our careers, our kids, marriage, our relationships, our money. I mean, but what I find very interesting is that Jesus points out something completely different first on his audience's worry list. Okay, number one on their list, food. This is the first thing, which is interesting because I know most of us think, man, if you ask, if I ask just all, all of you, you know, everyone watching, hey, but what's at the top of your worry list? Most people wouldn't say 
food. But at my house, it's, it might be the number one conversation that me and my wife have. It's, hey, babe, what are we doing for dinner? I don't know why. We hadn't figured out like a whole schedule. But nevertheless, it's a constant conversation. And our youngest son has to eat gluten-free. And I'm like, I ain't going to eat gluten-free. It's my birthday. All right, listen. So I was like, so we kind of... <laughs> Have this like, all right, so he getting this and he's going to get this and he's getting chicken nuggets. I'm going to go get something. And so like we kind of have this thing and it can just kind of like weigh on us. And I wouldn't say it keeps us up at night, but man, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's one of the top conversations. I mean, Jesus might look at, at our marriage and say, I think food's at the top of the list, right? I don't know. But what's also interesting is where Jesus goes second and third on his audience's worry list your body, and what you will wear. Once again, we may not say this out loud because it would make us appear too materialistic or vain, but let's just be honest for a minute. We know a lot of people, not you, of course, okay? Your friends and your cousins, not you, <laughs> that obsess and worry about how they look. They lose sleep over their image. They'll skip get-togethers because they're worried about how they look. And that worry bleeds into another worry, which is about what you will wear. If you don't think people are worried about what they will wear, go to Target, go to the mall and ask any worker there. You think people are worried about what they wear? They go, yeah, why don't you go look at our changing closets? Trust me, like there's clothes everywhere. People are worried about what they're going to wear. Some of you were late to church today because you were worried about what you were going to wear. You got eight outfits on the ground right now. <laughs> Here's the deal. Regardless of what your worry is, call it money, call it health, call it children, call it relationships, or wardrobe. Here's what Jesus would encourage all of us with. He says, is, is life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And then he says, hey, why don't you look up? That's what a conversation with God would do. Fix your, fix your gaze, fix your perspective. He goes, I want you, I want you to look up at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? When we pause, take a seat, open the scripture, and talk to God about what's keeping us up at night and what's got us worried, there's this question that Jesus points to, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? In other words, Jesus is going, what has worry done for you lately? I mean, nothing. Listen, there ain't a life coach, there ain't a pastor in the world that you would sit down with and go, you know what you should do a little bit more? I think you need to worry. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you just worry about it a little bit more, things are going to be all right. Nobody says that. I, I remember a few years back, probably about uh, when me and my wife first got married, uh, about seven years ago, um, I was sitting with a mentor, and it was early on in my career, and I just felt incredibly undervalued at my job. I felt underpaid. I was worried about finances. And so I told my mentor I had this idea of how I was going to go to my boss and give him a piece of my mind, okay? I felt unseen, but I was going to make sure I'm now seen, okay? I'm, I'm going to go prove myself. I'm going to go put on this spectacle and somehow get this person to increase my pay because I thought it was important. My wife was pregnant with our first kid, and, and I was worried about where things were headed. I'm like, man, I don't know how. Listen, I, I can afford to take care of one other human, but now you want to throw a third human in here? Things are getting crazy. I, listen, I can handle frozen pizzas and chicken nuggets, but now you want to throw in diapers? I don't know what we're going to do. Like, I was, I was worried. And I'll never forget what my mentor said to me that day. He said, Ryan, do you trust God or not? Do you trust God or not? Have you been putting God first in your finances or have you not? I said, I have. I said, yes, we've been putting God first in our finances. And then I was getting ready to like hit him with my rebuttal and he stopped me and he says, so 
just didn't tell me. What is it that you're worried about? Do you not believe that the God that can create stars 2,500 light years away can handle some frozen pizza for you and your family? It's like, what do you think's going to happen, man? I'm just, I go, man, I'm not worried about God. I'm worried about my boss, okay, who seems to be oblivious to what I'm doing around this place. It was like I genuinely believed that God couldn't handle a few extra child expenses, and I just, I was overwhelmed by it. In, in my mind, my, my life was throwing God off. It was like, oh, what are we going to do? It was like, I was the first person to ever have a kid. Like, just like what are we going to do? Like, I, I, I was genuinely worried about this whole new human, but it was there at that coffee shop, at a table with my mentor, that this question began to ring, to ring in my ears for years to come. If you really trust God, then what is it that you're worried about? That was the day I really started taking my worries about finances to God instead of placing my worries about finances on my employer. And what my employer couldn't do for me that only God could was give me peace about my future without any guarantees. All I know is that when I took it to God, he made me think of the birds of the air who he watches over and takes care of every single day. I have one wife and two kids now, and we can afford to eat a few gluten-free meals per week. And I look back now, and I cannot believe what I used to worry about. Whenever I take my worries to God now, I'm often reminded of what I used to worry about seven, eight, nine, ten years ago that God took care of. And if he took care of it then, then what do I have to worry about now? I can't speak for you, but I can for me. I, I've just spent way too many hours in days of my life being worried about the trajectory of my career or how my kids will do in sports or health of family members. But what a conversation with God about all of that. It sounds like, it. man, it, it, it's me going, God, here's the things that are keeping me up at night. And I'd like to give those things to you. For you, it, it may sound like, here's the anxiety uh, I'm feeling about kicking off a new school year, and before I'm overwhelmed, I just, just want to commit that to you. I trust you with my friendships. Help me give my best in class, and may I not feel overwhelmed when it's not the grade that I hoped for. Hey, God, here's the pressure I'm experiencing at work, and I'm worried about more layoffs that could come my way, but, but Lord, I, I'm just going to give that to you. I, I trust you. At the end of the day, conversation with God looks like us giving up our way, our will, and our worries for his perspective, his plans, and his peace. That's what I think a conversation with God sounds like, a great exchange. In the next few moments, we're going to take communion together and we're going, to, we're going to sing two songs here at the end, and we just want you to be able to take some time to reflect on today's message and what Jesus has done for us. The scriptures say on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, broke it in pieces, and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it, for this is my body. Eat this and remember me. And he took a cup and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it this is my blood, which confirms the commitment between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Now, you don't need to be a member of our church to participate, but we do believe you should be a follower of Christ. Whenever you're ready, you can eat the wafer or whatever you might have at home online, which represents the body of Christ broken for you. Then you can drink the juice or again, whatever you have with you at home online, which represents the blood of Christ shed for you. After you take some time to pray and reflect, you can receive communion when you're ready.
We just ask you to remind us of your goodness and your faithfulness, and that you are worthy of our worship and our praise in every circumstance. God, we love you. We pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen, everybody. Well, it was so good to be with you. If you need prayer, there will be people up front that would love to pray with you. Have a good week, everybody.